I, I'll get off the stage. Katie Musosis, sorry, I'm sorry, has been uh, speaking for many years as an expert. She's the Chief Policy Officer at Hacks Hacker One, 2011 Executive Women's Forum Woman of Influence Award, and she led the security community outreach and strategy team responsible for Microsoft's bounty programs. She took that to a whole nother level, and uh, we're really glad that she could join us here today. So, uh, Katie, come share your wisdom with us. We uh, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Okay, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes. Yes, excellent. I am so pleased to see so many of you on the morning of a day two keynote uh, when this, uh, this beautiful atmosphere is happening and that reception was really nice last night. So I appreciate you coming out. And thanks to the organizers and the sponsors for this, uh, this conference. I'm really happy to be here. So, oh, and is someone keeping time for me? All right, Computer. I voluntold him to keep time for me, that's nice. All right, so um, how many of you already know what an SDL is, Security Development Lifecycle? Okay, bug bounty, anybody know what that is? Great. Um, vulnerability coordination, vulnerability response, as in dealing with the hacker community. Okay, we're gonna go over some of these topics at a high level and actually talk about how bug bounties and vulnerability coordination actually integrate into a security de development life cycle. Um, a lot of organizations feel like uh, they're a little intimidated by dealing with the hacker community and considering I did this for seven years on behalf of Microsoft, I can tell you that even with that many products, even with that many versions to support, even with a broad portfolio, it's not as scary or intimidating as it seems. We're going to go through a case study um, today and talk about some of the ways that the Microsoft Bounty programs actually fed into and enhanced the security development lifecycle as any vulnerability coordinate, coordination program should. Um, and we'll talk about some strategies for getting started with your own SDL if you don't have one, God help you, um, <laughs> and your own vulnerability coordination program. And then we're gonna talk a little bit at the end about some of the recent um, laws that have been getting discussed around security vulnerability research and what we can do about it. Okay, so there are a lot of words on this slide. I'm sure you can read. Um, I've been doing security for quite a long time. Um, started out my computing career as a Linux developer um, and um, pretty much decided that I wanted security to be the thing that I did. It was my passion. I'm much better at breaking things and breaking systems down than I am at building them. But I developed a healthy regard for those who build software um, and worked uh, for part of my career at Microsoft on the SDL team as well. So I got to see it from the proactive and the reactive sides during my time there. Um, doing it at that scale was um, you know, certainly instrumental in some of the organizational empathy that I was able to build and understand what the engineering teams really needed and be able to create bounty programs that a company that had said that they would never pay hackers money for vulnerability information in, ended up embracing. So um, in, other, in other work in my past eight years of my life, I've also been you know, a professional masochist in that I have been working on ISOs ISO standards. So um, doing this work, I ended up, I actually ended up doing subject matter expert work for the US National Body on Vulnerability Disclosure because I had written Symantec's Vulnerability Disclosure Policy and I had written Microsoft's Vulnerability Disclosure Policy and when somebody from Canada, do we have any Canadians? Don't raise your hand now because this is a bad time. No. <laughs> I tricked you. Um, <laughs> I got you to laugh about ISO standards at 9.30 in the morning, how about that? So, a uh, Canadian national body decided to propose a vulnerability disclosure standard. They called it a responsible disclosure standard. Wow. So, uh, so Microsoft said, Katie, you know about disclosure. Go make sure that doesn't, that doesn't turn into a disaster. So, um, seven years later, it was published. So, it was published in early 2014. And it's something a lot of people don't know about. Organizations don't know about it. Hackers don't know about it. They, of course, 
do not follow ISO standards. This is a standard strictly for vendors who are looking to receive vulnerability reports um, and interact with them in some meaningful way and come to some kind of uh, resolution and advisory at the end. But that's pretty much what that standard covers in about 48 pages. Um, but it took seven years to create that standard and obviously like drop the word responsible. Um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit in terms of how and where uh, the planning for compliance to these standards actually fits into the SDL as well. And I work on a number of other standards. Uh, this is just uh, me at work. I think, is Pellis in the room right now? Because I think Pellis actually took this picture. Oh, he totally didn't wake up for my keynote. Anyway, Pellis and I and some of the other folks, actually Alex Stamos, who was your keynote yesterday, are all part of the At Stake Mafia. We were some of the first application penetration testers. You know, the company started in 1999, 2000. I joined in 2003 as an app pen tester. And this was me in the San Francisco office kind of making a little joke. Um, because I was on, I had been on a previous pen test gig with a gaming company. And they had decided to give me this pink hoodie as a thanks for my work. And I said, I don't actually wear that color, but you know, for you, I'm gonna wear that color in the next gig, I'm gonna buy a matching, in this case, it was a Hello Kitty television to test their games and their online games. Um, but I mentioned organizational empathy, and this was one of the best lessons that I got in that, in that being a pen tester working on a penetration test for a gaming company, you ended up understanding more about what actually concerned them in terms of security threats. And for me, the eye-opening aha moment was when they uh, essentially said that, you know, yes, credit card theft and PII theft is certainly a concern on our platform. However, cheating and the ability to essentially make this game not fun for people to play is something that we're more concerned about. So having to look through that lens um, as a you know pretty pure security person at the time um, really taught me a lot about organizational empathy, and that did come into play um, a lot in terms of dealing with getting Microsoft to do bounty programs. So this is just a resource slide. I'm sure they'll make the slides available later. Um, but these are some ways uh, to describe a security development life cycle or some sort of means to build security in to your development process. Because we should all know that it's actually a lot less expensive and painful to prevent as many security vulnerabilities from going out the door as possible, right? So in terms of bug bounties, I look at bug bounties really as just another word for incentive. Um, the programs that I created at Microsoft were more structured incentive programs, and I'll go through the examples in the case study, but a bug bounty as sort of nomenclature is misleading in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of people end up being intimidated. How many of you run bug bounty programs? A few of you. How many of you are thinking about it? Okay. How many of you, yeah, thinking about it, right? Um, but how many of you have heard certain objections like, we'll never be able to compete with the black market? You heard that one? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, analyzing market gaps and creating incentives that actually look at levers other than price. Okay, so there are no one-size-fits-all bounties. If you've ever been a penetration tester or worked with pen testing companies, you'll know that they'll always want to scope the engagement, right? So there, the similar things need to happen with scoping a bounty program. Um, one of the best returns on your investment for a regular vuln coordination program with no cash rewards and a bounty program is if you can align what you're asking the research community for uh, with your engineering goals. And that way, sort of integrate them as a broad, extended team to help your security get better over time. And it also cannot replace penetration testing. I've heard a lot of people talk about the cost effectiveness of bounty programs and say, you know, oh, this is great, so much cheaper per bug. The issue is that, you know, the, the crowd definitely uh, can find some issues that your professional penetration testers or your in-house security teams may have overlooked, and that's a wonderful thing to have that door open. However, there are still times when you want to bring people in 
fairly early in the development process and you want them to be under NDA and you want them to you know, look at specific areas, maybe have certain areas of expertise, etc. cetera. Um, so there's always room for all of these different models. And what I am about to show you is a very dry version of, actually, if you saw, how many of you saw David Rook's presentation on leveling up uh, security, application security program yesterday? So this is a much drier and more horizontal version of what he was showing you um, with beautiful, beautiful gaming art in his. But this is essentially, you know, the, the rough pieces of a security development life cycle. And there are variations on this. We will not get into, uh, you know, any kind of process debates here, but you all get the idea, right? There's a design phase of some sort, then you're writing some code, you're doing some kind of testing and verification, you go into release, and then afterwards, there's this piece called vulnerability response. So when I look at this and I explain to people where vuln coordination lives and where a bounty program might live, there are several logical insertion points. So penetration testing can often happen in this phase. It can be an in-house thing. It can be a mix of in-house and third party. But there are also ways to do it with an invitation-only bounty program. Um, there was a similar program that I ran at Microsoft for many years before the public bug bounties ever came into being, and that was getting individual researchers who had reported some very interesting issues into the company under contract to find bugs full time. So that is a version of an invitation-only bug bounty program, but it feels and looks a lot like a penetration test. So it's got similar elements to both. And what I really want to stress here is that so many organizations overlook the fact that this is, this is part of your extended security team. The hackers of the world who want to come to you and report security issues are actually there to help. We do not live in the world of Austin Powers where Dr. Evil is outlining his massive plan to destroy you via a vulnerability report. So that's not happening. So I mentioned the ISO standards this morning during the release phase when you're planning on how you are going to respond to security incidents, that would also be a great time to make sure that you are following uh, international best practices for vulnerability disclosure and interacting with the hacker community, have a really easy to find front door, and have a meaningful way to communicate to affected users, whether they are end users or part of your software supply chain, upstream or downstream, that's basically people affected by your security issue, have a way to communicate with them via an advisory or bulletin or notice, some, some way to do this, that gives them meaningful information, including things like affected versions, um, how to tell if you're affected, where to get a mitigation or where to find a patch, um, and the ultimate severity of the issue should the issue actually be exploited. That kind of meaningful information is codified in ISO 29147. ISO 30111 is more of the process of doing the actual investigation, the triage, the root cause analysis internally to your organization, and that one actually applies whether the bug was reported from the outside or it was found through your internal testing processes. So they're both important for you to have, and certainly, even if you don't have a vulnerability coordination face to the outside world that 29147 says you should have, 30111 pretty much applies to everybody. So finally, you're in the response phase, and I don't know if you can see any of that, but it says execute response plan, execute vulnerability coordination program, and potentially, if your response is mature enough and you've invested enough in the earlier phases of your SDL, perhaps you might be ready to run a public bounty program. So I spend a lot of time actually counseling um, some potential you know, folks who want to use the HackerOne platform into not running a bounty program right away. Um, you'd think I'm Captain Bounty, but actually it's more about making sure that their organization is ready and prepared to deal with vulnerability response at that scale, and often starting them out with an invitation-only bounty program, just like Microsoft did, when Microsoft had pretty much unlimited resources to deal with this, and still has one of the biggest software security teams in the world. Okay, so mentioned David, I saw his slides, 
I was jealous of his art, and I said, please send me your art slides, because they're so pretty, look at that. So I deliberately left like the font problems in here, so you'd know I just ganked his slides. He said I could do this. But look at these glorious pictures, right? So, so much better. Um, yeah, no, these are great. So what I actually wanted to get to here is that even when you've done as much as you can do through all of this art, let's just, look, this one's beautiful. Um, even if you've done as much as you can do, all software contain bugs, contains bugs. In the, at the end of the day, you will have this sad little guy somewhere in your organization. It will be so sad because vulnerabilities do slip through. And it's a matter of what you're going to do about it. So, um, let's time check. I'm going to go into the case study next. And I can talk about this for days. This represents, this work right here that I'm going to talk to you about represented three years of my life getting launched and then another year of running the programs. Um, great, okay. So, we're gonna go through uh, the initial pro bounty program goals, um, what the overview was of the bounty programs that were actually launched, and then talk about how they actually mapped back in and fed back into the SDL. So, there were several different goals. So, overarching, there were three bounty programs that were launched, and we'll go through those in detail, but the goals were to learn about any vulnerabilities that remained at the end of that process and that sad little character at the end. Um, learn about any vulnerabilities that remained in the code as soon as possible after it was released. And learn some, something about new mitigation bypass techniques. How many of you are familiar with what a mitigation bypass is? So it's, okay, so it's like an exploitation technique that can defeat all of the platform level mitigations like ASLR, ZEP, all the things that are supposed to make exploiting a particular vulnerability more difficult. So learning about a new exploitation technique is intrinsically valuable to pretty much only one entity in this equation, and that is the vendor themselves. Attackers don't need to use new exploitation techniques. How many of you have heard of return-oriented programming? Right, Rob. So that is a mitigation bypass technique. That is an exploitation technique that works just fine right now. So no attacker really needs to invest in a new technique. But the people who need to know about it the most and make deep architectural changes and feedback that information into their security development lifecycle is the vendor. So community goals, there were a number of goals in engaging with new researchers who not necessarily going after the ones who want to make the most money possible the ones who are already selling to the offense-only markets, let's say. Um, really just wanting to reach a pool of the researchers who are willing to, you know, spend their time finding these bugs and, and looking at into, into new exploitation techniques, but would like more than just 12-point aerial font credit in a bulletin. They would like a little bit of cash for their work. Um, mind you, the vulnerabilities that we're talking about in these offense-only markets, go for six figures a pop. So keep that in mind. And then, um, you know, some of the other higher goals of these programs were actually disruption of the vulnerability market as it stood. And we'll go into why that that generally was a goal and why we, why I think that it was working pretty well. Okay, so here were the three bounty programs that were announced in June of 2013. Uh, $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty. Uh, I wrote two $100,000 checks during the time that I was there. Um, a bonus for defense. This prize continues to go unclaimed. Um, and why is it less than the $100,000 uh, exploitation technique bounty, even though defense is actually pretty hard? Well, proof of concept, fully working exploit code was required for bounty number one, the six-figure bounty, and a white paper only was required for bounty number two. So that bounty still has gone unclaimed, but I think it's still very important to make sure that you're, you've created an incentive for defense as well. Um, the IE11 preview bug bounty was the only true bug bounty in this trio of bounties that was launched. It was a time-bound, 30-day bounty at the beginning of the IE11 beta period. So I'm going to show you 
some data. Can you see this? Okay, do you see, do you see there's like a dotted yellow line here? Right, and you see the blue line. So what this represents, the blue was actually IE10 beta, actual bug reporting trends. Um, so this is during the beta period, and you'll see a break in the graph, and then a big spike. What do you think, any guesses, and no, nobody who works at Microsoft can answer this question, any guesses on what that spike represented? Out of beta, exactly. So that is when, that was after code was released to manufacturing, so that was RTM right there. So why do you think there was this big spike in IE10? So there's no bounty present at the time. Any guesses? I was talking about different markets, right? But there were all these altruistic hackers who had, you know, would keep reporting vulnerabilities to Microsoft for free. Where were they? Do you remember their currency? 12-point aerial font in a bulletin. There are no bulletins for vulnerabilities that are fixed during beta. So even the most generous of hacker souls who are out there were inadvertently trained to sit on their bugs during the period that it would have served the engineers and the customers the best if they could have just come forward. So you'll see a few would come in, and these are all rated critical or important, so these are bulletin class vulnerabilities. A few came in, but not many, and then a big spike. So what do you think the other markets were doing? What I call the offense market, and that would be your nation state who's only using these vulnerabilities for attacking other entities and spying on you. Um, so there's those. And then there's the mixed use market where they may be buying them and trading them for uh, either purpose, offense or ostensibly defense. Those markets also are not buying during this period. Why? Because their investment may just disappear in you know, the next rev uh, or when the product goes to RTM. So there was a gap in the market. So remember I said IE vulnerabilities are trading on the, uh, on the offense markets at six figures, but only after this time. So no one's paying. Guess what? 30-day bounty period at the beginning of the beta period of IE 11 was traffic shaping. We were just moving when the spike occurred. So, actual results. There were 23 total submissions during that 30-day period. 18 of them were bulletin class issues. Four of those were sandbox escapes. Four. So what was really interesting about this process was we were able to, in real time, see and adjust some of the internal testing that was going on during the beta period, at the very beginning of the beta period. This was super useful, you know, in terms of stamping out some of the worst vulnerabilities. It was funny because I saw a paper come out, um, I saw a paper come out that showed there were earlier patches after release of IE 11. Earlier patches were available than with IE 10. And they were trying to draw some conclusions about, boy, howdy, you know, there must have been more issues. And I kind of tweeted back at them and I said, nope, just move the, we just moved the spike. So customers got protections earlier than they would have. Cleared out as many as, as they could during beta, and then the residual ones would get fixed pretty shortly after release. So you begin to see where some of these programs, they were very deliberate in how they were created. And when my initial run at, at doing bounties at Microsoft, three years before it was actually launched, when I was talking to the IE team, it was never about money. This was never about sort of a cost-benefit analysis because how many of you think that bounty programs or penetration testing is a really efficient way to find bugs? No, right? So it's not the most efficient way to find bugs, but it is a very efficient way to harness the power of the security research community and direct them to where you would like them to look at a time you would like them to look. So, um, future SDL requirements were influenced on the fly by these programs. Because, you know, you look at those four sandbox escapes, that's, sandbox escapes can basically be used, you know, to leak address based information, that kind of thing, um, and make exploitation of other bugs easier. So, these are powerful bugs. 
that have been revealed. Um, remember I also said community goals of interacting with some hackers who, you know, are good folks but would like to get paid for their work. There was one hacker who came in with six of these um, bulletin class issues and prior, Microsoft had never interacted with this person directly. He had only gone through ZDI. So he was part of this group that would come in on this spike. And he just said, well, that's great. I'm just gonna, just gonna go ahead and give you my bugs earlier. So, all right, James and the Giant Check. This was, uh, this was really funny. So he had already gotten the bounty awarded to him and, and all of that stuff. And I was at a conference with him and he said, I just picture you, a blue hat, handing me a giant check. And so I'm like texting my marketing people going, he wants a giant check, make a giant check. Because we're, <laughs> we're apparently gonna hand it to him on stage at Blue Hat. So this was, that, I did sign it, but that's not my real signature. Um, this was in the green room, uh, you know, behind the stage at Blue Hat, and I, I signed this giant check. Um, this was a historic moment because a lot of people Remember the, how do, you out, how do you outbid the black market? So one, you saw when the IE data, you didn't have to. Oh, I didn't mention the grand total price of these 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities. Anybody want to guess how much was paid out in total? That is a great guess. So there was a million dollar guess. Anybody else? It's like the price is right. Closest without going over wins. Who's, who's got one? Nobody remembers the prices, right? Oh my god, I'm so old. A million one. <laughs> 500,000, okay. 200,000. Oh, can't be more than a quarter million, says the guy who works at Microsoft, cheating. Cheating. Okay, guy who's paying attention. Guy who's paying attention. All right, uh, it, it was a whopping total of $28,000 and change. Because on average, basically, there were different tiers of payout. The most that they could get paid for a remote code execution vulnerability with a fully working exploit uh, was $11,000. The closest we came to paying that out was a $10,000 one because the exploit wasn't quite reliable. I gave the guy a pass um, because, uh, well, I think he and his wife had just had their third child, so I sent him $10,000 and a little blue hat onesie. You know? <laughs> there were a lot of dads in that group, actually. There was another one who works at Google, um, who I was like, oh, and you get a onesie, and you get a onesie, and you get a onesie. But, um, and some money. But the average price paid out was uh, $1,100, which was essentially, give us the bug and a POC, not a fully working exploit. And that was as far, you know, as much work as most people wanted to do, especially considering this is on the latest version of the platform at the time, with the most built-in platform-level mitigations um, at that point, right? So, here we go. All right, James and the giant check. Um, this, so outbidding the market is not a true lever. If you think about it, the resources of an adversary like a nation state, they are not going to just be like, oh, well, that vendor just raised their prices. I guess we go home. Can't buy any, can't compete with that. No, they just get more. So you'll be in a race you can't win if you're only thinking in this plane of price. So it's a multi-dimensional issue. And if you think about the market timing and you think about the ways that your particular hackers behave around your issues, whether they're trading on other markets or whether they're coming to you for free and what incentives you're providing to them that are non-monetary incentives like credit or onesies. Um, I suppose that onesie had value, but not, I mean, not like $100,000 onesie, right? So, um, so this was interesting. So up until that point, you know, people were skeptical that, that Microsoft wasn't paying enough and that something as valuable as an exploitation technique, a brand new one. These are rare. Do you remember when return-oriented programming came out? Somebody in this room remembers, but they're on their phone right now. Wasn't 90, okay, return to libc, yes, the granddaddy of, okay, this guy remembers, the original. But when ROP was explained, right? 07. 
Right, and here we were. Right, exactly. So it was 07 that it was, you know, this technique became known. Um, and uh, yeah, Twitter handle of Dion the God, Dionysus Blazakis. I murder all Greek surnames and I'm allowed to do it because I murder my own. Um, but uh, he was the one who came out and started talking about it. That was 2007. The next time that Microsoft heard of, a, of another basically major development in this area was several, several years later. And this was how I ended up getting them to approve a year round, no ceiling declared, like on how many these could be paid out, $100,000 bounty for new exploitation techniques. And that was because at the time there were only two ways, outside of having internal really smart people, which you're having them work on this problem all the time. But from the outside, there were only two ways before this bounty for Microsoft to learn about new exploitation techniques. That was either somebody gave a talk or an attack. Yeah. So um, the fact of the matter that creating an, a year-round incentive would provide an attractive thing for, again, you're not trying to compete with people who are always going to go for the highest price. You're working the numbers and you're working human nature and human behavior in that the majority of people, hackers included, pretty much want to do the right thing. If not, I mean, how many of you have hacked things for, oh wait, how many of you have penetration tested things? Pen testers, yeah. So everybody who has ever owned anything and felt that rush knows that you could easily turn to crime. You could rob banks, pretty much. Especially if you started doing it at the time that some of us in the room started doing it, which was long ago. You know, you could have gotten away with it. But you decided to do something else with it. So human nature, typically people do want to come forward with these things. Yeah. So the, the so this is a this is a great lead in to some of this. So what what the person said here in the front was it would be interesting to compare um, you know these bountied new techniques versus the ones that are discovered outside versus the ones that are actually discovered inside by your full-time in-house expert help. Um, what's interesting about this is that a variant of this was discovered internally, or how should we say this, maybe rediscovered internally because of a tweet of a hacker who liked to taunt the company and say, you know, I've got something, but you're not gonna get it because you don't pay hackers money. And kind of dropping a couple breadcrumbs. And what was interesting is um, that, is a great, that is a great illustration of what I said internally to have this approved year round. So there was a tweet. Then there were some other tweets from other usual suspects who were sniffing around the potential area. Internally, the guys started looking at what, what it could be came up with something, right? And then, fast forward to Kensec West that year, Pwn to Own competition. Anybody familiar with Vupin? Okay, so Vupin decides to use a certain technique. Why? Not because they didn't think they could get anything for it, but because they knew that technique was about to be blown by a speaker at that conference. So, there was all of this stuff leading up to that point. And when that first tweet landed, versus all the way up to the point where Microsoft officially got that new exploitation technique, it was about nine months. Nine months. So rather than have to wait nine months and cross your fingers and hope that something's going to come up, and it will be publicly disclosed at the same time that you find out about it, guess what? $100,000. So this worked 
hacker came forward, uh, described a bunch of uh, really interesting exploitation techniques. If you're curious about it, he blogged about it extensively, uh, much after the fact. Um, and uh, yeah, it's James Forshaw is the name of the, of the researcher, yeah. So, so the question is, how is it different? How is it different from paying off blackmailers? Like, what did you say? Russians calling in? What? <laughs> but it's a, okay. So, so um, how is it different from? No, no. Different, different, different person, yeah. But here's the funny thing, right? So let's say it had been the same person. Let's say it had been the same person. Um, would, would I be doing the right thing by holding to a principle and not giving the bounty payment that we were advertising just because somebody taunted us online? Would that be worth it? I don't think so. So anyway. Anyway, um, okay, so, <laughs> all right, let's, let's what, what's, what's the time that I have right now? Okay, so I've got 15 minutes to wrap it all up, and I can tell you guys are going to have questions, so I'm going to start moving faster. All right, so, first and foremost, invest in your security development life cycle. Your heaviest investments have to be here. You are never going to bounty your way, pen test your way, or you know, pay off blackmail your way to secure, right? <laughs> this is not gonna happen. Um, so if you are not making steady improvements and, um, and really learning from your mistakes and learning from the community, you're really doing yourself a disservice, whether you have a bounty program or not. Let's say you don't have a bounty program at all. You just have a vulnerability coordination program with the hacker world. One of the great things that I learned when I was at Microsoft was how how the SDL got revised. And when I started there, it was revised internally every six months. It moved to a year cadence, but essentially, the way that you would get a new SDL requirement into Microsoft's official SDL was you would describe you know, what kinds of vulnerabilities you were trying to eradicate. You would aim for, aim for trying to get rid of entire classes of vulnerabilities and then give MSRC case number examples of these vulns wouldn't have slipped through if we had this control in place. And that is how you should be using vulnerability coordination in any case, whether you're offering onesies or one millionsies, you need to have this feedback loop. So coordinate the, the bugs or the bounty program with your users, your customers in mind. Figure out ways that you can feed this back in at a time where it makes sense and aligns with your engineering capabilities. You all know this. Getting a bug report is a, is a blessing and a curse. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Somebody gave you a bug report, that's great. Now your engineers have to go and triage that. They have to put it you know, in a queue of things to fix. And guess what? They're not building your next version of the software. So, Using the incentives, whether they're onesies or not, to incentivize hackers to help you address bugs earlier, to help you align with your own engineering practices, and create this win-win between the research community and you. Okay, so how do you get started? Um, setting your goals. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Building your processes. I talked about the ISO standards a bit. Building your ops capabilities in both your development life cycle and your vulnerability response. Then, if you have some data, start measuring your trends. Um, refine your response and then feed it back into your SDL. So, you know, there were a couple different goals. SDL will re release more secure software over time. That's the general goal of all security development life cycle programs. Response goal, learn from the community, learn from your own mistakes. Um, and as I said, if you're not looking at big picture ways to try and eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities, you're gonna play whack-a-bug for quite some time. So you need to look at this strategically um, and then adjust accordingly. So 
this, again, this is a resource slide. You'll be able to peruse this at your, at your leisure um, at some point from OWASP. But I saw that White Hat Security had partnered with OWASP to release a very quick five days of setting up an application security program. Um, so that was timely. I think that was like, what, a week and a half ago or something like that, that that was released. Um, and then understand these vulnerable disclosure and vulnerability handling process standards. You know, if you want to pay them the money, that's great. I don't see any of it, just so you know. Um, or uh, I think I made a video on YouTube that's 20 minutes long, so if you want the crash course, there it is. Um, and then what happens next is you have to determine your realistic bug servicing capabilities. So you will get an initial spike of reports. Whether you are starting your very first vulnerability coordination program or bug bounty program, you will experience a spike. Plan for it, deal with it, it's okay. One of the funniest things that I ever received uh, was does anybody remember the Blue Hat Prize? This, this was a couple years before the bounty programs. This was a contest for defense technology and it was over a quarter million dollars was offered for this. Top prize was 200 grand. Uh, submission that I got for in that initial spike, a lot of spam, a lot of real inquiries, a lot of things you know where people didn't understand what a mitigation bypass really was. The best one was a flying machine. Treasure those moments, because really, when you're in the middle of a spike of launching something new, and you get someone saying, I've got it, it's a flying machine, and here are my plans. Um, really cheers you up. So <laughs> prepare for this, um, and, and prepare for the wide variety of things that you will need to triage initially. Um, so it's really important to build your own rapport with your own community of hackers. It's not just important for potential recruiting opportunities and community huggy feels, but it's actually important for you as an organization to learn to interact with these folks. Uh, you may want to do some temporary staff augmentation at first, manage that spike. Um, and some of these areas, you know, uh, for those of you who are on response teams, you, you recognize this, but essentially um, filtering the noise is something that's, that's going to be pretty important for you at the beginning. Okay, so measuring your trends. If you're starting out fresh, definitely put out a welcome mat for people who want to report vulnerabilities to you. That's a good thing for you. But focus on your SDL. Don't even think about doing a bounty program unless you have really made some solid investments in secure coding. And then if you've been at it for a little while, what are your bug trends? So the goals of the SDL, remember, you're trying to reduce the number and severity of security issues in your code that makes it out the door. So if, if your bug trends see your issues going up in number and severity, you need to go back to the SDL drawing board and you need to figure out where things are breaking down. Um, if they're going down in number and up in complexity, if you're able to see more and more complex bugs, more interesting bugs come through the pipeline, whether it's you know, a, a monetary reward program or not, that's great. That's actually a pretty good sign that your security development lifecycle is working. These are great trends. Um, and then once you are comfortable with vulnerability response and how to feed that in and how to tune and adjust your SDL, maybe it's time for you to think about a bounty program. So here's some goals and ways to do it. But is that 15 seconds that I have left? Wait, is it 15 minutes past the hour? What does the 15 mean? Oh, that's great. That's fine. That's plenty. Um, so if your goal is to protect your largest existing customer base, consider bountying products with the most market share. That might not be your latest product. If you want to focus on securing your newest products, learning the most from your newest mistakes as opposed to your old and busted mistakes, then focus on you know, bounty your products in the latest version only, but it fix all supported down level. So every customer gets the benefit of your bounty program at the latest. That's exactly how the IE11 uh, bounty program worked. All fixes were ported down level to all supported versions of IE. And then if you want to learn about loans as early as possible, bounty during the beta period, or as we showed in my horizontal, less colorful, no pictures of monsters version of the SDL slide, um, you can actually do that in an invitation only program quite a bit earlier in the SDL. And, it, and finally, if your goal is to disrupt your adversaries, 
bounty new attack techniques and provide a research outlet for new defense techniques as well. People may not come forward with that or they may come forward with impractical solutions you know, that, that degrade performance too much or whatever, but you may glean some really interesting concepts just from offering reward for defense. You also get to see out there the pool of people who are interested in defense and potentially good at it. That's a lot harder of a pool to identify through other means um, in general. Most of the top uh, finishing finalists for that Blue Hat Prize, which was the defense only prize, were from academia. Okay, so remember, this is the horizontal slide that is less fun than this slide. But the point is, where, where does vulnerability information feed back into your SDL? How can you use vulnerability coordination and alignment with the hacker community um, to get better at writing more secure, secure code in the first place? And these are the logical insertion points of these processes. And the sad guy will not be alone because an army of friendly hackers will be there. Which brings me to this. So how many of you heard of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, CFAA? Okay, great. It's way many of you, or way many more of you than raised your hands for earlier questions. Um, so how many of you heard about the White House's proposal to amend some of the language of the CFAA? Any of you worried about this? That's great. Me too. Me too. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in broad strokes essentially makes doing vulnerability research on specific kinds of systems very risky for a hacker. In 2007, um, I worked with the MSRC. I had just joined a few months earlier. And we did something that was a big deal at the time. We put a little note on one of our security pages that said, if you take the time to report a vulnerability to us privately and give us a chance to fix it in our online services, which were live production servers running on our equipment, then we will not refer you to legal action. That was a big deal at the time. Other companies definitely followed suit and you know, made it clear that they were not going to try and prosecute friendly hackers. But that only goes so far. Even if you have a bug bounty program, turns out, I've been talking to lawyers, it happens, I'm already doing policy work, I might as well talk to lawyers. But, um, <laughs> but even if you have a bug bounty program, that doesn't actually protect security researchers from criminal litigation by the Department of Justice, should the Department of Justice choose. It's just a fact, yeah. So when the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is, well, it, is, it has been in place and it has had a chilling effect on security research of online services in particular. Because it's very risky. Even if there is a declaration of some sort of legal amnesty coming from the company, that doesn't eliminate, essentially, the overarching crime. How, how many of you saw Alex's uh, keynote yesterday? Okay, so I was in a meeting. <laughs> is he here? He's in a meeting right now, is what's happening, right? So I missed it, but I heard that he brought this up as well. And um, I'm not sure what he said because I wasn't there, uh, but what I will say about this is that the hacker community have been trying to report issues to get them fixed for decades. The areas that are particularly risky for them under the current CFAA are online services. We all use online services. We all use services that are in production in some manner or fashion. And when I think about this problem, I look at it like, can you imagine what a world without hackers coming forward would look like. Remember that grim picture that I was painting of the fact that, you know, certain new attack techniques, impossible to learn about them through any other means except attack. Or, you know, if it were, if it were uh, more of a chilling effect in terms of security research, anonymous O-Day dropping would just be the way. And that would be the best they could do. So, the action for you, if you care about this, if you're worried about this, 
is to write to your representatives and ask for a research carve-out for the CFAA. Actually, the EFF has a good little tool where you can look up who your representative is and write to them. And then if you are part of an organization that deals with hackers, especially if you are part of a very large organization that deals with hackers, you have lobbyists. They go to Washington all the time. You should be talking to your lobbyists about getting a research carve out for the CFAA because without it, you'll end up in a world where you're blind until you're hit in the face with an attack. And if the goal of the president's changes to the CFAA is to enhance security, there's no better way to do that than to embrace your allies. Okay, questions? Yes? Do you find that certain industries are especially resistant to the idea of bounty programs? So the question is, do I find that certain industries are very resistant to the idea of bounty programs? Yes, uh, there are early technology adapters and late technology adapters. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember um, having conversations with organizations early in, in the pen testing world where they were having to justify to management, why would you hire somebody to hack into us? Does this sound familiar? Why would you pay someone to hack into us? It is ultimately the same argument um, that had to be made, but it is, I think it's a natural progression of uh, modern vulnerability reporting and finding. And quite frankly, you know, it took seven years for that ISO standard to come out, but I think that ultimately, even those industries, like financial institutions and other very risk-averse industries, are going to, one, look at the fact that the international security community has said that there's a need for this, at least at a coordination level with the hacker community. Um, and beyond that, I would recommend to them that they get really good at security response before they move into a bounty program at all, no matter what industry you're in. Other questions? Yes. So you, you can hire external pen test and code review, and trust me, IE does, you know? But there are bugs that remain, regardless. You can't hire all the experts in the world. And even if you could, they have a fixed amount of time before you have to release your software. So being open to hearing from people after the fact, that after you've released, is critical for your ability to support and secure the software that you just wrote. Other questions? Yes. So the question was, I mentioned competing with black market prices isn't the right way to do it. How do you know that you're stealing your bounties right? Well, um, there are a lot of ways that you can look at it. Um, if you think about how the, the Microsoft ones were tailored, the individual bug bounty for IE11 was up to $11,000, because it goes up to 11. Thanks. Yes, I'm here all week, folks. Anyway, um, so there's that. But that, it, it did actually work, right? Um, one of the things that we were looking at was, is this enough? We think so, because there's no other player buying at that time. It's either zero or what we were offering. And then the other price point of $100,000 was that was the price at the once a year competition that year at Pwn to Own. So essentially matching it to the existing defense market was the goal, not outpacing it. One more question? One more. Okay, so the question is, I've heard some of these bug hunters have shady, shady pasts, and some of them can't even enter the United States. That is a great question. How do I deal with essentially paying criminals? Well, let's see. If they can, yeah, you can pay them in Bitcoin, that's true. 
No, but um, put it this way. If they are not in a country that is embargoed by the United States, a trade embargo country, it is technically possible to pay anybody. And why wouldn't you pay someone coming forward with vulnerability information that you have asked for, regardless of their past? Has anyone ever got a speeding ticket? Parking violation. Well, you're not eligible for a salary anymore. I'm sorry, criminals. So the point there is, it, you know, I'm, I'm making light of the subject, but um, this came up in context of writing the announcement blog. And they said, you know, they tried to edit my blog and say something about, we look forward to working with white hat hackers. I said, no, no, no. Actually, any color hat, we are not discriminating on the color of their hat. In fact, right now, they're all green hat hackers. They hack for money. So, if they would come forward, they'd be helping us. So that's what we did. All right, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Um, if you guys will stick around for just a minute, um, our diamond sponsor wants to say a couple